Hello, everyone, and welcome to our 21st session of A Course in Miracles. Tonight's um, lesson is going to be No Sacrifice is Required. No Sacrifice is Required. It's going to be a lot. It's going to be a lot, y'all. Um, the lesson that's highlighted tonight, lesson 21, is I am determined to see things differently. Last week was I am determined to see. This week is I am determined to see things differently. Uh, so before I get into the lesson, I wanted to um, say that this past Saturday, April 20th was the first day of spring, and God has been blessing us with so much sun. I would like to uh, encourage everyone to get out and get some sun. I just participated in a virtual retreat this weekend where several channels were channeling Jesus and other beings who are coming forward to guide us. Uh, and the consistent theme throughout the day was a call to get out in nature, to plant flowers or fruits, vegetables in your gardens, go to the park, sit on the porch, whatever resonates with you. They emphasize that the sun has uploads for us to receive, and we cannot get this information if we do not go outside. Light carries information. Not only is this demonstrated in us energetically, but also in our foods. This is why foods that are grown under the sun are usually rich in nutrients. Um, I know that most of us are confined to our laptops in our homes where we're working from home and our children are in school virtually. And many times by the time the workday is complete. The energy from our electronics have completely drained us. I see this in my kids and myself. After we have met our obligations of work and school, we just want to eat and lay down at the end of the day. On top of that, our kids only have a few moments for a break and then they have to turn around and crack over, open their laptops again to do their homework, which ultimately um, allows us only a small window of time to try to connect with nature before the sun goes down after six. This is not by coincidence. This is on purpose. There is heavy programming behind this schedule. There's heavy programming behind the concept of homework that even when you are done for the day, you really aren't done for the day. You really cannot relax and enjoy your freedom. Let's not use our powers of free will to miss out on what is freely given to us by God. I encourage everyone to be solution oriented and find ways to enjoy the sun during the day. I've decided with the kids that when the weather allows that we'll sit on the front porch while they're taking their Zoom classes. I'll sit on the front porch while doing my, my work. Many of us have Wi-Fi that will allow us to stay connected on our porches and balconies. Let's maximize that. Also, if you have windows, that allows the sun to stream in, sit next to that window while you work. Uh, many of us have started to work right through lunch. Uh, a lot of times the, the work day gets more out of us working from home than when we have to really go to the office because at the office we have a schedule where this time is my time, I, I eat, I nourish myself. We work right through lunch, um, stop that. Utilize your lunch break to go for a walk. And this doesn't sound like a big deal, but this one shift, this one decision to soak up the love and light that is your birthright will make huge shifts in your energetic body and therefore your life. It will raise your vibration and you will feel amazing. If we 
are not careful, if we passively follow the leadership of the powers that be, we can find ourselves in a world where the entire culture of our country has turned into a lifestyle where the American thing to do is to stay in the house, where the responsible thing to do is to stay indoors all day and all night so that others won't get sick. I'm not saying disregard those who are immunosuppressed and the elderly and their susceptibility to suffering from illness or whatever. If you don't feel well, don't go around others. I still encourage you to at least go in the backyard and allow the sunshine to shine on you because that's where the real healing is. But generally speaking, <clears throat> when you're feeling well, please do not allow your freedoms to be chipped away little by little. This past week, I felt very heavy in my heart all week. It was just like very, just a sad feeling and I couldn't figure out why. And finally I got the kids out on Saturday and I swear it's like the feeling just disappeared. And I realized it was because I was in the house too much, I was inside. So let's make a commitment to love ourselves and enjoy the sun. This is our demonstration of self love. This is important y'all. It really is, trust me on that. There are uploads that we are set to receive that comes from the sun. So, um, so okay, y'all, it's a lot, it's a lot we're doing. So tonight, I want to open up tonight's session. Uh, first of all, I wanna highlight uh, lesson 199 of A Course in Miracles, which says, I am not a body, I am free. Um, that's a beautiful lesson. Uh, I'm not a body, I am free. And so this speaks to the theme of what we're gonna be discussing tonight. Uh, this evening's lesson, you all, is going to be one of the most impactful, insightful, and exciting lessons I have had the opportunity to learn and to teach in this platform. I wanna start out by saying that the information that is available to us is overwhelming in both volume and magnitude. We are fortunate during these times that if we seek information, we find it. And the more you find, the more you realize you've not even began to scratch, scratch the surface of what is available to, to us. Tonight, we're gonna really blow away the fog of what has been told to us throughout many, many centuries by the structures and powers that be who have wanted to keep the truth hidden from us. This is about us being seekers of the truth so that we may recognize our own divinity and power more and more. Everyone who is listening to this lesson, it is very important that you research this information yourself. I'm gonna be reading from A Course in Miracles, which is a channel text from Jesus and a book called Jesus, My Autobiography. Takia has this book. Um, uh, and it's just that, it's Jesus's autobiography in his own words. So um, it's an accounting of his life in his own words, which is, it's incredible, y'all. So I'll be, I'll be reading a little bit from that tonight. So uh, too many times we've simply received information and consumed things that were told to us as truth. And it's created beliefs in us that are not only inaccurate, but has caused us to suffer unnecessarily and have created beliefs about God and ourselves that have kept us small. And the truth is, there is nothing small about us. We are so big. I'm gonna start out by asking a delicate question. And those of us who um, have come from religious backgrounds, 
all of us really are really going to have to be challenged to expand because I grew up in a religious household as well. So, um, so you may you it, you you may struggle with this a little bit because of the widely held beliefs that we've been all, all been told all of our lives. So I just invite everyone to open yourself up to more information. Now, of course, Jesus was murdered and was hung on a cross. That is undeniable. In the context of what we have learned about Jesus, uh, we've been channel, we've been following his channel texts, of course, and miracles. We've been reading from conversations with God in the context of the character of God what we've learned about our own beauty, our own divinity and our own sinlessness. Um, and so the context of everything, the fact that God will not banish us to hell forever and that he loves us unconditionally. Does it resonate with you? Does it resonate with you to hold the belief that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Does that make sense to you? That Jesus needed to die on the cross for us to live. And just think about that for a moment. You don't have to answer unless you want to. Um, because we're going to let the books do the talking about that. We're going to hear directly from Jesus about that whole process, because this is not Loretta's opinion. This is straight from God. And as I teach, I learn. So I'm learning this as well. And I actually um, have decided we can forego the meditation tonight just so that we can create a space to talk about what we've learned. So I'm going to start out. I know that was a big intro. I'm going to start out in A Course in Miracles, page 36, and write it down for your notes for your later study, because we are men and women of truth and investigation. So um, page 36. So I'm going to start in pa on paragraph one. Paragraph one of page 36 in A Course in Miracles says, a further point must be perfectly clear before any residual fear still associated with the miracles can disappear. The crucifixion did not establish the atonement, the resurrection did. Many sincere Christians have misunderstood this. No one who was free of the belief in scarcity could possibly make this mistake. If the crucifixion is seen from an upside down point of view, it does appear um, as if God permitted and even encouraged one of his sons to suffer because he was good. This particularly unfortunate interpretation, which arose out of projection, has led many people to be bitterly afraid of God. Such anti-religious concepts enter into many religions, yet the real Christian should pause and ask, how could this be? Is it likely that God himself would be capable of the, think, of the kind of thinking which his own words have clearly stated is unworthy of his son? I'm going to continue in, in the second paragraph Sentence four, it says, persecution frequently results in an attempt to justify the terrible misperception that God himself persecuted his own son on behalf of salvation. The very words are meaningless. It has been particularly difficult to overcome this because although the error itself is no harder to correct than any other, many have been unwilling to give it up in view of its prominent value as a defense. In milder forms, a parent says, 
this hurts me more than it hurts you and feels exonerated in beating a child. Can you believe our father really thinks this way? It is so essential that all such thinking be dispelled, that we must be sure that nothing of this kind remains in your mind. I was not punished because you were bad. That's sentence 10 and paragraph two. I was not punished because you were bad. The holy benign lesson the atonement teaches is lost if it is tainted with this kind of distortion in any form. The statement, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, is a misperception by which one assigns his own evil past to God. The evil past, Jesus puts that in quotes, has nothing to do with God. He did not create it and he does not maintain it. God does not believe in retribution. His mind does not create that way. He does not hold your evil deeds against you. Is it likely that he would hold them against me? Be very sure that you recognize how utterly impossible this assumption is and how entirely it arises from projection. This kind of error is, is responsible for a host of related errors, including the belief that God rejected Adam and forced him out of the Garden of Eden. It is also why you may believe from time to time that I am misdirecting you. I have made every effort to use words that are almost impossible to distort, but it is always possible to twist symbols around if you wish. Sacrifice is a notion totally unknown to God. It arises solely from fear and frightened people can be vicious. Sacrificing in any way is a violation of my injunction that you should be merciful even as your father in heaven is merciful. It has been hard for many Christians to realize that this applies to themselves Good teachers never terrorize their students. To terrorize is to attack. And this results in rejection of what the teacher offers. The result is learning failure. So he continues and he says, I've been correctly referred to. So now Jesus is now referencing some language in the Bible and, and, and kind of clarifying what that is saying. He says, I've been correctly referred to as the Lamb of God who take away the sins of the world. But those who represent the Lamb as bloodstained do not understand the meaning of the symbol. Correctly understood, it is a very simple symbol that speaks of my innocence. The lion and the lamb lying down together symbolize that strength and innocence are not in conflict, but naturally live in peace. Blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God is another way of saying the same thing. A pure mind knows the truth and this is its true strength. It does not confuse destruction with innocence because it associates innocence with strength, not with weakness. Innocence is incapable of sacrificing anything because the innocent mind has everything and strives only to protect its wholeness. It cannot project, it can only honor other minds because honor is the natural greeting of the truly love to others who are like them. So um, I read that from pages 36 to 37. So right here, in paragraph two, sentence 10, Jesus says, I was not punished because you were bad. Um, I don't see how Jesus could have been made that any more plain language than that. Uh, he further talks about that God does not believe in retribution, that he does not hold our evil deeds against us, much less 
that he would hold them against Jesus. He then says that sacrifice is a notion totally unknown to God. So please understand that this is a story that was laid on Jesus after his crucifixion to help to keep us in fear. Was Jesus murdered? Yes, but the death of his body was not a sacrifice for our sins. Remember, last week we learned that Jesus used the crucifixion as an opportunity to teach that violence is never justified, that we are not our bodies. So I'm going to allow, if anybody wants to speak on that, I'm, I'm going to allow you guys to speak. If not, that's, I'm going to proceed and I'm going to start reading from Jesus, my autobiography, uh, which in his words, which I think is important tonight to hear in his words, he really takes us through the journey of his crucifixion. Um, uh, Takiya, is Takiya on tonight? No, she has this book. Uh, again, let me show you. Jesus, my autobiography. And I love how they made the, um, the borders. I know it's kind of hard to see. Made the borders kind of look like the Bible. So this is one of those things where, let's say you were killed, you were murdered, right? And um, after you were murdered, people started putting stories of your life together. I remember he said this, I remember he said this, and some of those stories are accurate. Some of those stories are not because everybody has different perceptions. And imagine that people layer your life with their own intention. Uh, if God this, did this to his son, imagine what he do with, to you. Uh, this is why he died. It wasn't because we wanted control. It was because of your sins. You're responsible. So um, Jesus Inspiring, this book was written by Tina Spaulding, uh, channeled from Jesus. So there's a process called automatic writing where he tells the same process with conversations with God, where he told her where, what to write because Jesus wants to take his name back. Many things have been done in his name. And so this is his way that he's saying, no, you know what? I want to give my own story and my own words. So in this book, which I encourage everyone to get um, when you can, I'm going to start on page 102 to 103. Okay, so um, there's so much I'm gonna be skipped. It's a lot, this is a lot. So the title of this is called Healing the Sick and Performing Miracles. So it says, I have told you that Mary was with child and she was not able to travel for obvious reasons and for cultural reasons of that time and place she would not have been welcome in these large gatherings and she would have been ostracized upon her return. It was a mutual decision on our part that I would head off on journeys to do this teaching work and to do this healing work. It became very apparent that my abilities and healing were magnificent and that I had been bestowed with this vision an ability to see sickness within bodies and to see what was causing it. So you must understand that I will describe to you what I was in fact doing. He says, it is true that the mind creates the body. This is a fact, not supposition. It is the truth, your thoughts, beliefs, prejudices, fears, desires, hopes, and dreams are all manifested in your physical body as structures. This is where health comes from and where sickness comes from. If you have a repetitive, hateful thought about a being, 
you will create a negative area within the physical body related to that relationship. Let us say you have a hateful thoughts about your mother. This might manifest as a problem in the uterus area because that is the area of female reproduction and represents the energy of motherhood. This would be an example of the kind of thing that I was able to perceive. And so he continues, he says, enlightenment is this. It is the absolute transformation of mind, removing all the blocks to love's presence, removing all blocks, all fears, and all hatreds. And it is often accomplished when beings have done much work themselves, working with love energies, forgiveness, compassion, and these kinds of things. I had done much work through my teens and 20s, and when I was on my track to remove fears and thoughts from my mind that caused pain and suffering. Often what happens is the non-physical beings, what you would call ar archangels or ascended masters, teachers who have moved on to higher realms where there is complete awareness or a connection to the divine in an absolute and uninhibited way are able to communicate with beings who have done much of the work and they are able in one motion to eliminate the thoughts and ideas of limitation. This is what enlightenment is. You then become aware as a human being that you are still manifested in the physical body but you are aware of energies, ideas, concepts, and connection to love and divine nature that most human beings are not. This is what had transpired with me. So every time I met somebody, if I focused my mind in a particular way, I was able to get this information. I was able to see where his or her sickness was, and I was able to ask for intervention from the higher realms from these ascended masters and these higher beings to transform his or her mind. And as the mind is transformed absolutely and unequivocally, the body responds. This is what you call a miracle. It is something that is out of time and out of the normal laws of physics, cause and effect that you believe to be true. Most of the laws that you believe in can be completely overridden because they are based on belief. And in fact, there are enlightened beings who can override things such as gravity and are able to levitate, bilocate, meaning being in two places at one time, and do all kinds of things that your physical laws, as you believe them to be true, do not support. This is what happens when the mind is raised up into realms of the truth. This is what we're doing. We're raising our minds up into the realms of the truth, uh, the realms of divinity. There are no physical limitations. That is the world I functioned in at that time. And as you can imagine, it was, diff it was a difficult burden to bear in some ways, for I began to upset the apple cart so to speak. So um, again, so Jesus starts to dispel myths and misunderstandings told about him, including the fact that he married Mary. He talks about that on page 103. So he starts with private versus public life. And he says, this was also one of the reasons why my dear Mary did not travel with me and all these circumstances. I did not wish her to be put in a place of danger. It was clear very early on in my ministry that the powers that be were very upset by what I was doing. I was delighted at this turn of events, of course. I was a rebel. I was a troublemaker. This was my purpose in life, to free humans from the dictates and the unfair rules of oppressive regimes. This is what I was doing, and they did not like it one iota. It became very clear to us both that this was dangerous territory we were entering to, into. However, we agreed that there was no turning back. 
that there was no stepping off this train that that was picking up in momentum and mary in her wonderful supporting and loving way in her intelligent and spiritual way understood what we were about as we were in this together she gave me her support by wishing me well on my journeys and treks and i came home frequently this is not written in your bible it was not apparent because i did not wish it to be apparent I did not wish Mary to be involved in these processes. I did not want her to be put in danger or at risk in any way. So when I was out and about doing these things that I did, speaking and teaching in these, this way, I did not mention my wife. I did not mention anything about the life I lived, the private life I lived. I was very fortunate at that time. It was a different time than you are living in. This was not what humans can do at this time. Your life is public if you go into the public realm. But in that time and place, if you kept your mouth shut, nobody knew what was going on at home. So that was what I did. This is why in your Bible text, you see no mention of my wife, no mention of my children, and no mention of these things because I made it very clear to those who I worked with that this was the policy, that the private life was to remain so for safety reasons. And of course, everybody realized what shenanigans we were up to, rattling the structures of oppression that were at play at this time. They knew that it was very important to me that my wife and family were kept safe and kept out of most of what was happening. This is why in your text, you do not see mention of this and you do not see mention of most of my life. Do not be surprised that there were aspects of my private life that were not documented. You must understand that your biblical texts are very small fragments, in fact. They are minute wisps of information compared to what my life actually was. I was a human being living 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and 12 months a year, as you understand it. And I had many, many experiences and many, many relationships and many things happened uh, and that were not documented. So you have a book that you consider the word of God, but it is not the word of God. It is a fractured and incomplete text written by men trying to explain things they could not explain. Also, there is much information missing from that text. There were gospels and there were sections of writing that included teachings about women, marriage and sexuality that were removed in the early phases of the church because they were offensive to some of the men who were in charge. It was clear after my disappearance from the physical world, that the church was going to be a powerful thing. You could motivate people very quickly with the miracles that I had worked and with the effect that I had on the populace, with the charisma with which I had affected people. This was the truth. There were beings very early on in a church who were not enlightened, who were not focused in love, and who were not focused on my teachings per se. They were focused on what it could bring them as political animals, as beings and offices of authority. And it was used for this purpose, but I digress. I will return to this when I began my ministry, I set up. I set up relationships with men who in the Bible were called my disciples. They are named, and these are reasonably accurate depictions. So he's basically saying the disciples and their names, they, you know, they were accurate, but they were beings who chose to, who chose to travel with me. They were not forced in any way. They were interested in my teachings and I began dividing my teachings bet between two particular realms. I was using my parables and simple stories for those beings who were uneducated and who were visiting for a short time. 
I did this partly so that they did not get in trouble with their own religions and their own structures of culture. I did not wish to disrupt people's lives and cause them problems, but I did wish to instill in them some concepts that would help relieve suffering in their hearts and minds and daily lives. And so these were the stories that I fabricated, the parables that I talked about to people. So then Jesus talks about that he began to teach um, the disciples how to heal. Uh, he says, these disciples of mine began to practice among themselves, doing this work, focused meditation, focused observation of sickness. And we began to work together healing people. I would tell them where the sickness were, was, and they would begin to work through mental focusing and through certain body movements to focus the energy field of their own bodies into the bodies of those humans who were sick. They were able to affect considerable healing of their own. So this is what we practiced for some time for it was a technique that I had been told to teach others. I was told this, that this ability could be affected by many people if they focus their intention onto healing. Uh, this is not what humans did. They focused their attention on sickness because they did not understand the creative process behind it. When they understood that sickness was created from negative beliefs and negative thoughts repeated over a period of time, then it became clear that focusing positive loving and pure thoughts on the same area could affect a reversal of that condition. So that's what started to happen. There were many women in my groups to whom I taught the specifics of the energy work that I did. Now, I was a much more accomplished practitioner of this, of course. I was provided with such clarity of mind, such clarity of connection to the higher realms that I was able to affect almost instantaneous transformations of the body. The people whom I worked with as disciples had a much more difficult time of it because their minds had not been cleared of all their own thoughts, their own negativities. But that is what I worked on with them in private, of course. I did not do this work in public. This work would have been considered sorcery at the time. It would have been considered some kind of devil worship. It went against all the laws of the Old Testament. It went against all of the Jewish teachings and the priests and higher ups and the Jewish traditions would have attacked me. As it turned out, that is what happened over time. But during my ministry, during these travels, I taught as many people as I possibly could and sent them out in small groups to pass this information along to other beings so that it could be shared. I could only teach so many. I could only instruct so many. And he says, this was a society that was divided quite strongly between the domestic home life, which was the area that the woman controlled and the outside financial, political and religious realms that the men tended to gravitate toward. As healers and as transformers of lives, women held the key to the family home and to healing small children and birthing healthy babies. These kinds of things, so there, these kinds of things, so there was so much, there was much communication between me and the women of the communities in which I found myself. This is something that is, of course, not covered in the Bible. So um, I'm going to read. So now Jesus has been in the ministry long enough where the powers that be were beginning to conspire to kill him. So I'm going to read from page 109. Um, it says, I had to balance my personal desires as a human, as a man, as a husband, and as a father with my higher purpose, which was to assist beings to heal their limited thoughts and beliefs 
and to try to teach them some new ways of seeing the world, for this was my purpose. I was told that I would be attacked by the powers that be. I was told that I would be put to death by the powers that be. And of course, this was a very difficult thing to hear, but I understand from the communications, but I understood from the communications I received from the non-physical that this was part of the teaching, that I was going to have to show people that the human body was not lost in death, and that the spirit, the human consciousness carried on. This was part of my work. I was informed of this quite early in my ministry, I would say two years before my crucifixion. And so I was very appreciative of time with my family. I was very appreciative of the freedom and self-expression that I had. I knew that I was being asked to do something that was very difficult. I knew that I was going to be asked to do something uh, transformative um, because this information was given to me early in my ministry. It indeed motivated me to teach more, to travel more, and to be more present in my life, for I knew that it would not carry on forever. This, uh, this awareness does not change you. No, I'm sorry. This awareness does change you. So it's like, somebody telling you, you have two years to, to live. So after telling you something like that, every moment becomes different. So Jesus is talking about that. He says, you have some idea of this, that if you were told you were gonna die in two years, you, you would live a completely different life than if you did not have this information. And so this is exactly what happened to me. I began to speak more passionately. I began to exert out of my energetic focus and communicating with people and the crowds that came to see me became quite large and onerous to manage. Some of the stories in your Bible speak about this, of having to preach from a boat off the water's edge because of the crowds of beings. And this was indeed the case. There were many thousands of people at times who would congregate and often I would have to escape by boat to another part of the land to remove myself from the crowds that were relentless at times in their following. They were desperate to experience the miracles I was able to work. They were desperate to experience the truth I was able to speak about. There was an energetic shift when the crowds of people, uh, within the crowds of people as I spoke that transformed their consciousness. And they felt it as peace and they felt it as love. Whenever they were in my company, they had a sense of well-being that disappeared when, when I left. This was an energetic projection that I was able to afford to the beings in my presence because of the input of information and energies from the non-physical that flowed through me. It was really not my human self that did this. It was the energies that were flowing through me from the higher realms because of the clarification process I had been through. This is something that you all will be able to do. And I was clear about that in the Bible. I wish to reiterate that statement here. There is nothing that I did that is not feasible for you all given clarification, given study, given focus, and given understanding. I will go into this for further later on, but for now I will say that despite the exceptional experiences, despite the exceptional stories that are told about, about me, I was indeed instructing my disciples in how to do this how to affect healings, how to change their minds and how to use the practices of forgiveness and compassion for clarification purposes. That is why that particular teaching was in the forefront of the Bible's accounts. I taught forgiveness for judgment is indeed the biggest interference to connection to the non-physical world. It is judgment that will keep you in the dream, separated from your source. This being that you call God 
that is an overall overriding energy that pushes you toward love, acceptance, and freedom. So, um, so, so this was Jesus leading us up to his crucifixion and, and, and expressing how conflicted he was when he was told that he was going to be killed. Um, on page 113, Jesus talks about how he was able to raise his vibration enough to break the rules of physicality, such as gravity and time. Um, and this is what happened when he walked on water. So um, on page 113, it says, um, I was speaking about my ministry in the last installment, and there are, of course, some major events described within the Bible that come to mind. I begin with the idea of my walking on water. In the physical world, you have rules that you must comply with, gravity, time, and these kinds of things. You must eat food and you must breathe air. To get somewhere, you must walk from one point on the planet's surface to another. You cannot instantaneously move yourself there. However, in the vibrational elevation of the human consciousness, there are things that happen that allow you to break these rules. This is all that was happening in the story of my walking on water. It was an illusion. My friends were not actually seeing my physical body. They were seeing a representation of my body. At the time when I was walking on water, I was in fact meditating in a cave not far from the edge of that particular body of water. The disciples saw a projected in image of me and had a conversation with my consciousness. This ability to manifest a virtual body, if you will, for other beings to see is not unusual in Eastern yogic practices. This comes from the enlightenment process, the full awakening process. You are able to see that the body is a projection. You are able to see that your body is created second by second from your thoughts. And this is the same principle that applies to miraculous healing. The body you experience as a solid object or the body that you experience in your current consciousness as something that is immovable is very difficult to change. It is one of the great illusions that, are you, that you are immersed in. So that was what, was what happened in that circumstance. I was meditating and I projected my consciousness to where my friends were. And of course, because the body they saw was not the solid kind, that they were used to, they mistakenly believed that I was walking on water. When in fact, I was just suspended. The image was suspended slightly above the water. The calming of the seas was the same effect. The mind that is completely connected to source is incredibly powerful. It is able to work miracles and you must understand this. All of your all of your environment in every way, shape, and form is coming from your mind. So a mind that is an absolute connection to God, to source, to all that is, and that is completely aware of the laws of manifestation can change anything. Changing the weather is no more difficult than changing the television station. That is all that is happening. The effects of fear which is what that storm was, a manifestation of the fears of the beings in that boat, could be changed by my calm and loving consciousness. That is what happened. These miracles are not as miraculous as you think they are when you begin to comprehend that everything you see is playing out in your mind as a dream. For you know that in a dream state, in your normal sleeping experience, you can change things instantaneously as soon as you realize that you are dreaming. So, um, so Jesus is basically talking about, he's given us the background story about some of the, um, 
you know, the, the stories in the Bible of, of things that occurred in his own words. So I'm almost done. I'm going to continue on the bottom of page 115. Um, it says, as this ministry continued, there was much dissent. The more the crowds gathered and the more influence I had over the local beings, the more concerned the priests and officials of those areas became. There arose a groundswell of desire to put an end to this disruptive force. For you must understand that I created events by my teaching and by my presence that would at times put a whole town out of business for a day. There would be so many people coming to listen to me speak so many people with sick family members or needing their own bodies healed that entire towns would stop functioning for the duration of my visit. So I kept my visit short and sweet. And, and as you say, still there was much grumbling and dissent from the powers that be within those areas. So I kept moving. There were officials higher up in the realms of government who heard these stories. And there were higher ups in the church, the religious structure of that time, who were completely threatened by me and who saw that I was having more influence over the parishioners they had previously controlled. They were losing their power. And this was the beginning of the end of my teaching ministry. Um, and then Jesus continues, he says, the hardest thing for me, of course, was my family. This is a part of the story that becomes difficult for me because Mary was not in the same spiritual vibration that I was. Despite our love for each other and despite the family we had created together, this was something that was very difficult for her to bear. But she knew through our Many discussions, I had discussed this with her for some time, and it caused her to shed many tears and to ask me not to participate, but I told her that a momentum was building, that I could not stop teaching, and the powers that be would not allow me to continue teaching. It was a perfect storm that was bound to end in confrontation. I did not want it. The human part of me did not want it. But the part of me that was connected to source and had known these out-of-body experiences and my true nature was fearless in the face of death. For it knew that death was an illusion. I knew that death was not real. And I knew that I would be able to present myself in physical form and that I would be able to recreate a body as easily as these beings intended to destroy my body. The most difficult aspect of my teaching, the most difficult aspect of my experience on earth was convincing my beloved Mary that this was the path of highest intention and of highest result. Our sons were completely oblivious of my life, just as your children are oblivious of your careers they do not know if you are a criminal lawyer or an actor of some other kind. They do not know what you are up to in your day and they do not care. You are their parents and that is all they care about. To sit on your laps and hug you, to play with you and these kinds of things. My children were no different. We did not involve them in what was going on in the adult world. And then um, I thought it was important to read a little bit about, uh, he talks about Judas. So he says, as this conspiracy began to breed in numbers and grow in power, it became clear to me that this was the time for the reckoning. I went toward the eye of the storm rather than trying to avoid it. This is what happened when I went to Jerusalem, fully knowing what I would be subjected to. The betrayal by the one that you call Judas, this poor being who has become the symbol of hatred and unreliability and deception throughout your society played a divine role in my transformation. 
And his part in that journey was a very painful one for him as a human. But on a spiritual level, there was no judgment. This being had, has not been condemned in any way. And in fact, he passed into the non-physical very shortly after I passed into the non-physical. And there was a communion of our minds, a meeting, a meeting of our minds after the departure from the physical for he was brought into awareness of his full participation on a spiritual level in this what would be considered a terrible betrayal. But that was his job in his life. He had volunteered to play that role in this drama. And after he passed over, he was given this information. He did have a difficult time for a little while, believing that he had killed me and that he was totally responsible. When he passed over, however, he was given the information that this was a cooperative effort and that I had gone willingly into the experience to prove what I was speaking about. This is exactly what happened. I demonstrated that I was not a body. I demonstrated that death was not real and that this was the most magnificent of opportunities showing my disciples the truth of my existence. And then um, Jesus talks about, and I'm gonna close with, with, with this last part. He talks about the body is nothing. He says, you must understand that from the perspective of the crowds of beings who were of no particular uh, consequence, I was just another badly behaved person killed for that bad behavior. That was all they took from it, nothing more. But for all the beings whom I had taught, all the disciples who I had instructed, all those close and loving friends I had been preaching to and teaching for many years, this was a powerful event. This was an event that demonstrated my ability to overcome the physical, but not because I was the son of God. I never claimed that. That was not what I said. I always proclaimed my equality with other beings. I always proclaimed my sameness to others. And I continue to complain, proclaim that throughout this text. But I did have some skills because of my practice and because of my enlightenment that other beings did not have at that time. So I was in a place of instruction. There was no sacrifice here. This is a very important part of this book for your culture having mis interpreted this act of crucifixion and death, believed that I was sacrificed my life for other beings. That is not what I did. I did not die. I sacrificed my body, but my body was nothing. This was the message of the crucifixion. The body is nothing. It is already a corpse. It is already nothing in and of itself. It is the animating force the spirit, the awakened mind that can animate the body on its own volition. And that is what I was teaching for many, many, many generations. Your culture and the church have mistaken the act of raising awareness for an act of sacrifice. And this is not the case. It is not what that this was for, and it is not required. I did not sacrifice anything. I merely handed my body, which was of no consequence to me whatsoever, over to be destroyed and killed to offer up the example that this was not going to stop me. This was not going to be the end of me. This was not, in fact, going to hinder my teaching in any way, shape, or form. So this teaching that the church has taken on itself to promote which is that sacrifice is holy, is something I wish to put to bed now. This is something I wish to put to sleep now. There is no need to sacrifice anything. You do not need to sacrifice your happiness and you do not need to sacrifice your body and you do not need to sacrifice in any way. Your obligation to live your life to the fullest with the greatest awareness, love, 
and self-expression that you can. That is what I did. I lived my life to its absolute fullest. And because I understood the lack of meaning of the physical body, and because I had mastered the art of manufacturing a new body whenever I desired it, I truly comprehended how meaningless the body was. And I attempted to demonstrate this to my disciples. I attempted to demonstrate this to the beings I had taught. So I, of course, I can't read the whole book. There is so much information in this book. Before it got to that point, Jesus talks about himself as a child. He even talks about his mother and his birth and um and how he was as a as a child um he talks about leaving and studying with the yogis um and learning things and how mary was mad at him because he was leaving and how i mean it was he, he makes the um his life so personal, uh, uh, but so much opportunity to grow and expand. So uh, why is this important? Well, it is important to understand that there is no need for us to sacrifice ourselves and our happiness for anyone. For many religions, the message of the cross can be one of fear and violence a warning, if you will. But there is no need to think that anyone needed to die for our sins. God does not think in terms of punishment. Uh, and as A Course in Miracles says, we are holy sons and daughters of God. This belief of sacrifice has permeated throughout our society and has push, pushed many people to do things they do not want to do. Uh, young adults sacrificing their passions to continue the wishes of their parents. We talk about people living in abusive marriages because they think that sacrificing themselves for their partners is godly. Some parents stay in bad marriages and often say, I'm making a sacrifice for the kids. So we're, we're going to stay together for the kids. When in fact, many times the kids wish their parents would just get a divorce because everyone suffers in that situation. Um, I encourage everyone to take time for yourselves. Parents, allow time to meditate and pray. Let your kids know that there will be times when mommy and daddy will need time to spend time alone. Do this without guilt. Remember, you cannot love others unless you first love yourself. Um, so that is all I have. I know this is a lot. I know this is a lot. And, and that's why um, we're not going to meditate. I want us to share our impressions. Everybody doesn't have to agree with what was read. Um, but I do want you to kind of see how that feels. See if it resonates with you. See what makes sense. See what does not make sense. Investigate on your own. Do research. Get A Course in Miracles. Get some of it, the Jesus, my autobiography. Get Go within. Meditate on this. Think of, kind of think about how you feel. And I do know that there was a channeling from Jesus that says to many of us, we have been lied so much that the truth sounds like a lie. And when he said that, I was like, oh my gosh, that is so true. So does anybody know pressure to share? This is a lot to sit on. Does anybody have anything to share before we close out uh, this evening? Any impressions, questions, comments? Radio, it's a, it's a, it's a lot. <laughs> it's a, and right, right, it is a lot, right? <laughs> it's a lot to take in, especially yeah. for some of us who are raised in a church yeah. to hear a different perspective. But I think um, sometimes it's it's good to hear another perspective 
mm-hmm. on this just to shape your way of thinking because um you know I, I firmly believe that the bible is it's all storytelling right it's somebody's yes. depiction of what happened yes and we already know with storytelling there's not always this hundred percent accuracy yes. and we would never know yes you know what portions of it are exact truths or just yes. again you know storytelling yes. from people's recollection which is what it is yes to some degree yes. um so this is why like when i've approached religion i kind of approach it with a grain of salt like I don't look at it as being any right or wrong because who's to say like you know the Muslims versus the Jewish versus this? like who's to say any of it is the religion right so I don't know like hearing all of this I just believe it's one of those other things one of those things where like it <laughs> makes me realize that I just live your life <laughs> in a way that is pleasing to others and pleasing to yourself. And and when I say pleasing to others, I mean like, you know, just don't do wrong by people in general. Yep. And make sure your heart is clean and, you know, like the actual text wording and some of the principles that we follow, I feel like that was, that that happened by design to at least create some sort of structure Mm -hmm. for how Mm -hmm. to live. Mm Mm-hmm. And it was needed or it is needed. Absolutely. But um, when I hear things like this, it makes me, you know, think about how I approach some of these biblical principles or teachings that I've, I've learned. Like I've had, and I think you kind of said it before, like I've had, I was in a mall one day and a woman came up to me and she's like, you know, God is a, isn't a man, right? Like <laughs> he's a she. And, you know, and, 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 she, and she went scripture by scripture and gave me different yeah. examples as to why she felt that right and I was like okay it's good to hear your perspective um but it makes you think right so it makes you think like right is is everything that's written actually absolute truth and it's not so for me I'm just like just live your life <laughs> in a way that makes your, your heart clean you do right by others you help people and that's it what she said that's my two cents (laughs) what she said yes I love it because this is all about spiritual expansion opening our minds up there are some people who will not even listen to these videos because they cannot integrate the concept of Jesus channeling through anybody right because sometimes it's people feel safe by staying And one, let me just stay right here. This is all I've known. This is my safe space. Don't tell me anything different. So yes, Roxanne, that's a beautiful response. Um, And understanding that without the Bible, many of us would not even have that foundation of really who God is. So the Bible has a purpose, but also integrating the fact that, like you said, these were stories relayed. When I was with him, he said this. No, when I was with him, he said this, and it, he meant this, and he meant that. And everybody has their own perspective and their own agenda as well. So um, I encourage everybody to get. I know I always throw so many books at y'all, like, you need to get this, you need to get this. <laughs> Um, but, uh, you know, if you really want to just read it, uh, there's so much that Jesus, one thing I love about Jesus is Jesus never holds information. He always freely shares everything It's you don't feel like, oh, he keeps it on. I mean, he shares everything. And when you read this book, you will see like, oh, wow. You know, it's exciting. I I think that's exciting um to hear from him directly so uh I love y'all uh it's 7 15 I'm, I'm not gonna hold y'all any longer with a meditation thank you for listening thank you for hanging on and listening uh so you know if, if nobody else has anything to add uh, you're welcome, Grace said. Thank you. If anybody else ha- doesn't have anything to add, we can we can leave, and I'm going to stop the recording.